Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thanks for joining us after I hope you've managed a quick lunch. Um, thanks for coming to the Is Tell Your Story of ITV Studios session. Um, the aim of this session really is for you to get a sense to understand how ITV Studios can help you make your programme, can help you finance your programme, uh, and really how they can help you editorially and financially to get your programme into the um, ever-changing international market. Um, it's going to be a fairly business-oriented session. Um, and obviously we're talking about finance, but I hope that we'll also be able to get some editorial value from it, get a real sense of what the market is after at the moment. Um, so even if you, uh, I hope there's some takeaway from this, even if you don't have a project that you feel completely fits. Um, we've got a great panel joining us today to do this. Uh, we have Sess Olsen, who is SVP of Global Content at ITV Studios. Um, Uda Strive, who is the Director of Operations at Blink Films and Outline Productions. Uh, Anthony Geffen, who's CEO of Atlantic Productions, and Carlo Mazzarella, who is CEO of Blinkpool Films. Uh, the shape of this session really is pretty straightforward. Assess is going to give an overview of ITB Studios, show a little clip, and let you see um, really what they're up to. Uh, and then we're going to have three case studies, one from each of our panelists. Um, the point of these really is they all have different funding models and different experiences uh, of working with ITV Studios, so the hope is that we'll get a more comprehensive view of how, um, how working with them works. Uh, questions are welcome at any point. Uh, do just send them in, and I'll either bring them in during the case studies or we can have a free fall at the end. We'll just see at what point they come in. Um, so, yes, do you want to start? Do you want to give us a quick overview of ITV Studios? And work in this area? Yep. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. I hope you're not having uh, you know, a lull after lunch, and if you do, quickly do make a cup of tea. Uh, but yeah, who is ITV Studios? So um, I think what's important to understand, first of all, is that ITV Studios, even though we do belong to the ITV overall group, we are not connected to the channel. So they can't say to us, or we should distribute, and we can't tell them what to commission. Sometimes you want to say sadly about that, obviously. But no, we stand independent from the channel, but we are connected to all the production companies that um, do work within ITV Studios, of which are about 57. And um, our um, vision and goal and mission, if you like, on the distribution side is to try and get as many productions um, possible out there to the wider marketplace and be able to sell them for you. So are all shows available to be sold internationally? No, not everything. But if we can try and sell it, we will. And our sales team are 36 people strong, dotted all around the world. Um, and so we are ready and uh, would love to come and help work with you. And uh, I think as the session says, uh, we would love you to tell your story with us. But we don't just do non-scripted and scripted, we do formats. Um, we have a plethora of um, different genres. But to really get a good understanding, perhaps, about uh, the type of content that we have, and you might be surprised, uh, why don't we um, have a look at that show reel? Great. Obviously, a massive range of shows there, SS. Like, um, extraordinary. But I, sorry, go on. No, I was just going to say that it, it look, like, I must say, I think this year, m more than many years, I'm so incredibly proud of that um, show reel and of those shows that are in there. And interestingly, um, I think we are represented by all um, four of you. So um, thank you so much for trusting in us and um, um, believing that we can help uh, be a good partner of yours and, uh, and bring your shows to the masses. Great, and obviously mainly for the for the Docfest audience, we're thinking more in the sort of in the in the uh, documentary sphere, um, and therefore the three clips we've chosen sort of represent that from single films to series. Um, do you have a sort of a, emphasis? Are you like most distribution companies really looking for series, or are you completely open minded in terms of what you're looking for? So this is an interesting one, looking at trends. If you had asked that question maybe three years ago, I would have said, oh, no, singles are terrible, never ever want them. But as it happens, that's absolutely back in favor in uh, around the world at the moment. Uh, Two-part series, three-part series. If you can tell a story well in the shortest um, uh, amount of time, then broadcasters around the world really love it now. And um, they are less favorable to really long-running series. 
uh, unless of course a long running series is because it's been recommissioned and recommissioned so that's a new trend um to look out for at the moment but yes for us singles we welcome them we like them certain genres are better for that than others maybe uh, such as crime or standout particular events it could be weddings it could be legends it could be um access people to particular um, people, for example, um, and or places in the world. These are things that um, we look for. And um, yeah, basically, if the story can be told, uh, we'd like to hear about it. Okay, great. Well, let's move on to one of those stories. Um, and to you, Ulla. Um, Hi. So do you want to? Hi, welcome. Um, so we're going to talk about Conjoined Twins. I don't know if you want to give a quick overview and then we play the clip. Yeah. Um... As um, you said, Greg, right at the beginning, I am very much on the business affairs side. So I happily introduced the clip, but if you want to have more information about the content or how the stories are being told, um, I'm not the right person to answer and I won't answer these questions, but then I the am. film is going, you, you well, can, can, you can, can uh, well, Cecilia, yeah. but um, it's, it's also, it's going out on the end of June. This is a two-part series. It's a two-parter for ITV, which was commissioned by Joe Clinton Davis. And um, we are telling the story of uh, two surgeons uh, who are the experts in this country and worldwide experts in the separation of conjoined twins. And we're following a one of their separations and telling alongside the stories of other separations that have or haven't happened and uh, in particular, one family who's got two girls who are conjoined, whose clip you will see in a minute, and who have to make the decision of whether they will or will not uh, separate the girls. Uh, the production started before, just so that everybody knows how we made this, started before what was commissioned before lockdown, and we didn't pause, we continued to work through and uh, managed to make it work um and the film's finished and we'll be going out at the end of this month so let's see the clip and then i'll tell you how we put the deal together that looks fantastic Ella. it also brings back memories of the first film i ever worked on 50 years ago was for joe clinton davis about wandering twins so uh, that's oh, how interesting. Well. <laughs> yes um, and it's um so Sorry, so do, you, so do you want to start off just telling, sort of talk us through the, the financial story of this? So did you start off with the ITB commission and then go and try and find extra funding or how, how did it work? Yes, yes we had, uh, Joe was interested and we realised that whatever money ITB would give us wouldn't be enough um, because it is, it is a story that's told over a long period um, and we, um, Yes, we didn't put this out for tender. We, we started talking, didn't we, at the time? And you said, yes, we really, really would like this. We think you, we can give it the special attention it deserves. And ITV Studios came on very early, very committed, and gave us a substantial amount um, advance that allowed us to make this film um, pre-COVID. Post-COVID, you know, it's more complicated, but um, the funding was, was agreed very early on. And with ITV, so ITV Studio is so committed, um, we could then just go ahead and started working with um, the families, in particular the Torres family, who you've just seen, to uh, work out how to follow them over the period of about 18 months. Um, and as I said, the films are um, finished and delivered and going out at the end of this month. And I mean, obviously, I'm not going to ask you for exact numbers, but in terms of percentages, um, how much came from the original commission, how much came from the advance? I mean, how big was your gap to fill, I guess, is the question. No, I'm trying to remember now, but it was at least 10, if not 50 percent, wasn't it, Cecily? Cecilia? Yeah. And I think the, the thing about this particular one is that it was um, it was such an emotional story. Um, uh, Ula and the team had made a little sizzle that we saw and we all cried. So, you know, when mm -hmm. people cry, then money follows. <laughs> yeah. And, and, um, and you will and cry your... again. <laughs> And what, what's your internal process, Sess, so, so people understand the thought process that goes through your mind when, uh, so Blink come to you, you have something that you think this is obviously great editorially. Do you then go through a, a sales assessment and all that sort of stuff so you get a sense of what, or is it less yes. than that? Yeah, so then we obviously make the finance team cry and then and job's done. <laughs> no, okay, it doesn't quite work like that. And, um, 
people come to us for a project at whatever stage, whether it is um, like in this one, obviously Joe Clinton was already quite committed. She really, she really mm -hmm. wanted to do this film and the money wasn't quite there. So what we then do is we ask what you need. We then go to the sales team and we build a forecast actually internally. And we look at every single market and where we think we can sell the show. On the back of that, we then know what we can advance for our show because um, we need to obviously understand if we can get our money back because that's how distribution works. And so um, if we believe in it, the sales team believes in it, it then actually goes to um, a sign-off process uh, with four different departments internally. And when that's all happened, then uh, we're all good to go and um, yeah, we do the contracting. But it's quite a few steps. But if it's a good story, it tends to be um, happy days. Great. It's and what sort of fast. time scale? I was it, just what I was about to ask. Yeah. So, so that can happen so quickly. Happen, yeah. Yeah. So we, yeah. um, we can be super quick. I think if, um, if it's a really large sum of money that you're after, it takes longer because then, you know, there's certain thresholds internally that we can dip into. And it also depends if it's, you know, one part or two part, or say if it really is an eight part, for example, it becomes the volume of money that needs to go out the door. Um, and, and then it has to go to an even higher um, stage of approvals internally for us on the finance side. But yeah, we can be super quick. And to be honest, also sometimes, you know, if you have a project and there's emergency around that, you can also just call us instead of sending emails all the time. We have a lot of emails. Um, but I think now, certainly for, for, for the team that's here today, everyone knows that they can just pick up the phone and we do answer. I know, it's incredible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, quite unusual. And Ulla, why did you choose to go down the distributor model, you know, and, and global rights going, you know, take a while to keep rather than a, another co-producer broadcaster? Is that because it was quicker or simpler? Yes, yes, it was quicker. And we also uh, were concerned at the time that would we get the bike from somebody else? We had taken it to a couple of American broadcasters, but the way we were trying to tell the story, because it was two UK consultants, uh, Waisy and Gordon, um, and uh, fo and focused on Gosh on on uh, Great Ormond Street Hospitals, we weren't sh the interest wasn't big enough, and we knew that we had to get going because there was a particular operation that we followed between a couple of two little Turkish boys that happened just before COVID. Um, so we didn't have the time. We needed to get into production, and we knew from ITV Studios that there would there would do this quickly enough for us to be able to just go ahead. We didn't have time. Right, which makes perfect sense. Time to get another co-producer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is a great opportunity for Cess to then jump in. Mm. Yeah, and also I must yeah. say, what was good about this too, other than the fact that we all cried, is that they had really good access. And when you have access to to places like Red Ormond Street Hospital, that sells worldwide because you know the normal person sitting in their living room all over the world. They are not going to ever go and go to that hospital or, or have access to these surgeons. So it, it's that as well that really was the unique mm -hmm. sort of setting point for this particular series. And initially, uh, the series was conceived for us to follow Ways and Gordon to also follow their other work. They um, not only do those kind of operations, but they also uh, do a lot of charitable work in Ethiopia. They would have gone to India to do operations there. So the whole film was being set up to follow this on a grander scale. And then with COVID, we had to change the scale of how we were filming, but we still have the, the same kind of relevant stories and ways and Gordon stayed on, on board all the way through, which is brilliant. It's interesting. And just because uh, people will always want to know sort of business terms and things. So mm -hmm. um, presumably you recover in first position, Cess, and then sales afterwards are split in the usual way. Yeah. Yeah, so you have our commission and then you have a 5% distribution expenses cap. Uh, there might be other expenses in this particular one, maybe not. And then, yeah, then we recoup and then we go to net. Oh, sorry, this is really basic, some of it, but I think it's useful for people that don't know the distribution world so much to sort of get a sense of how, you know, when, when they see more money from their sales. Um, we've already had a question come in, um, which is how long and sort of specifically did this show, if people can remember, how long did this one take to turn around financially and or, or and what is the quickest you've turned something around Cess with those and access presumably yeah I mean the quickest oh gosh the quickest we've actually turned something around 
So, so there's two different parts or, or answers to that question, really. One is, how quickly do we say yes? Well, we can say yes in 24 hours, sometimes even quicker, mm -hmm. if we think it's really good and we all like it. And sometimes we don't need to go and ask for a full sales forecast from a sales team because we just know that that type of show is going to work. Um, we might need to ask the sales team for forecasts, again, if, if the volume of money is higher. Um, and, and that's when it can take longer. If we need to involve the sales team, we might say provisionally yes, but we have to build it. And then that can take five working days to get the whole forecast. And it is because we have sales teams in America and Australia, um, in India, in, in Hong Kong, as well as based in the UK and France. So we just need to draw on all of them. And because of time differences, really, that's why it can take a bit longer. Um, and then if the money is high, we also then need to go through the process with the finance team. So the quickest we've said yes, I'd say is 24 hours and more likely it will take a week to two weeks to get all the numbers together if it's a high if, if it's a high deficit or advance. Just a word of caution though, the higher advance and deficit we pay, the less money a producer will see coming to them after the event because then all that money obviously will spend on making that production for you. So just something to be wary of too for you. Yeah. And Ulla, this, I'm in danger of, um, of us all alienating our relationships with any other distributors when I ask this question. And um, why did you, you say you didn't put it out to tender and you went straight to ITV Studios. Why was that? Was that the synergy with the broadcaster or because you had a pre existing uh, no, relationship? I don't no, the broadcaster had nothing to do with it. And ITV are very good at not pointing us towards ITV Studios when we have, com when we have several commissions going with them at the moment. So, um, no, I think, Cess, at the time we were talking about something else. And I started talking to you about it and you immediately said, I really want this. I think I can come up with the money. Can you give me a week? And I said, because what we normally do is uh, at Blink and Outline, we can put out the bigger projects, we put out a tender. So we ask distributors to tender for a particular project to see how much it's worth and how much money we can get for it. In this case, because Cess was so quick and, and crying probably, um, she decided, she said, can you give us a week? And she gave, and I said, okay, I'll give you a week before I take it out. And within a week she could, she could make good on what she was offering. And that was, that was that. Um, and it was a very painless process, but we're not, you know, we do work with other distributors as well on a <clears throat> similar basis. Yeah. It's funny. Painless process seems inappropriate talking about a film about separating Condor and twins, <laughs> doesn't it? But, um, <laughs> yeah. Um, Cool. Well, uh, I'm sure we'll come back to this, but that was a really useful um, grounding, I think. So thank you. Um, Carlos, should we come to you and talk about Building Giants? Yeah. Um, for anyone who doesn't know, Building Giants is a, an engineering series that follows the construction of the world's biggest structures from the world's tallest skyscraper to the world's biggest ship. I think we've made three series of this now. And I think we came to, and, and it's sort of the editorial is a mix of character driven actuality following the builds from the very, very early stages of the process all the way up to the grand opening or sailing of the ship. And then graphics, quite detailed 3D animations that take you inside the engineering process, looking at the design uh, and the clever innovations inside uh, these feats of engineering that make them possible. I think from the outset, we had four main co-producing partners on board, a Channel 4 in the UK, an Australian partner, a French partner, and a German partner. And I think we had a, a gap of around about 15%. And, and I think we talked to ITV about the project because they'd had um, some successful sales history in the past with a, a project some years ago. And we'd also had some further interest from other partners uh, overseas, but they were sort of interested in sort of seeing the finished program. Um, so ITV managed to sort of come um, put together an advance to help fund the remaining um, um, uh, finances of the series so we could start production. And again, the timeline was quite important for us because we'd spent the best part of a year negotiating access to eight really extraordinary bills. That's a very long and protracted process. And we were keen to get going to make sure we could chart the bills, even though the process of the series was made over 18 months. So the, the financial package of, of the four partners plus the distribution advance enabled us to start production. I think, I think one key thing with a co-production model of, of making a series like this is making sure that all your main co-producing partners from the start agree and align on the editorial so with this there was a little bit of discussion early on with one of the partners about whether their version of the project should have a host and that when you're dealing with shoots in eight different countries was actually very expensive and what you actually want from those different funding partners is to everyone to buy into roughly the same model of the program which in which ended up being uh, without a host and with the editorial agreed that we'd follow each episode would follow a different build from beginning through to end. So that's quite important with the co-producing model. You want 
everyone on board to roughly agree to the same type of film. But then the other, the, the smaller element of that is then each partner does sometimes require a different running length, a diff, some, uh, if you're working with a public service broadcaster versus a commercial partner, some versions of the program may need to have ad breaks uh, or local language elements for, for one of the partners in French, maybe. And then overall, you might need to film one of the stories in, in uh, uh, one of your co-partners territory just to make them all happy and to also make sure they got a show that really sells the series when it does go out. So those are some some of the elements that need to be you can be need to be really careful about when you're bringing all these partners together because you want largely all the money from these partners to go on screen to make the master version possible. So that in conjunction with ITV, we were able to make I think it was three different versions of the project, uh, which ITV then uh, could take to market and and and, um, and and sell to the remaining people around the world who who didn't come in as as co-producing partners. So that. That model was very successful for this type of series, which is quite international in its approach. So I think if you want to run the clip, we can sort of see a bit of the, the series and how it plays out. And it immediately makes you want to go and visit each one of those sites, doesn't it? Um, especially the, ice, the hotel. ice Hotel. I definitely want to go to the Ice Hotel once lockdown ends. I, I'm there. <laughs> I was going to say that feels like an exec visit, doesn't it? Essential. Um, <laughs> Before it melts. So just just to dig into the process you talked about just now. So what was the, what was the order of the of the co-producers you brought on, and then and then you went to ITV Studios for top up? Is that is that the ordering? Or yeah, so, so we 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 had a commitment from the main four broadcasters, and I think we we always usually on our projects. I don't think we've ever done anything that isn't co-produced largely. Um, I think there's a higher expectation amongst all the broadcasters these days that that uh, production companies can bring in a secondary partner. And it can and can't be, it's not always possible, particularly with, with content that's very, very British. There are some, some stories and, and some uh, you know, characters where the stories are just so local to Britain, they, they need to be told and fully funded. But then there are others like on Building Giants where there's a natural uh, international makeup, the editorial, and, and it makes more sense. So I think with, with that, we, we, we took about you know, six, six months to get the four partners on board. And then we really needed to get going to sort of follow the construction of some of the bills before um, too much had actually taken part. So, so that's where the distribution side of having an advance to complete the finances so we could get going um, would also happen. And I think there's also when you have more than two or three partners on board, there's, there's only so long you can wait until somebody else, one of the partners might want to start to fall away and then your, your house of cards of funding collapses. So I think that's where distribution can really help um, um, get the project away. Totally, and I'll, I'll come to you back in a, in a, in a minute, Sess, but this, is, this isn't directly relevant to distribution, but um, I think a lot of people find the international co-production world tricky and time consuming, and without relationships, that can be really, really difficult. How do you, did you build on pre-existing relationships to build those co-pros? Did you have to fly around the world and have meetings or? It's a mix of, I mean, I think we actually find that every year you need to work with another partner to make the funding of a project work. So I think we've been building up the, the relationships has been something we've been doing for sort of 20 odd years. So that, that process never does end. I think the key thing throughout the whole process, though, is to keep the partners involved, let them know what to expect, send them clips, because uh, it, it actually helps excite them. So when the project does go out, you know, they, they've all bought into the vision, they can see you've delivered on it, and they've got something that will really excite their audiences. And if there's a local programming that's made in that part of the world, whether it's the, the, the Ice Hotel uh, in, in, in Norway, or, or a big tunnel through the Alps, they can really put that program out first, and it enables the series to do well, and then come back as a second sort of series. So it is a lot, it lit is a lot of work, uh, but you end up with a series that can hopefully return with that model. Yeah. So, Sess, um, obviously, when we were talking about conjoined twins, you had the whole world free and an ITV up front. When this comes to you with four big territories already gone, presumably you have a slightly different thought process. Yes, we don't like that as much. But again, <laughs> there's something about this series where, um, you know, I talked a little bit about access. If you have access to things, to people and places, and in this particular one, there's a few things. There's access. But there's also the uniqueness that Windfall have of telling the story of how things are constructed, how it comes together. They sort of take all the pieces apart in CGI and then bring them all back together again. So it's a little bit educational as well. So therefore it becomes the scientific approach, it approaches the engineering part of it, and is the access point of it. And they are quite good pillars to think about for what works internationally. And even though, yes, some major territories had gone, you know, the world is a big place. 
And so for the rest of the world, we still have buyers that would love to have a show like that um, and who very likely would not be able to commission anything or pay for anything uh, by themselves. So, um, yeah, we would, we would still come in. Would and we be happier if it... you just sold it to one country? Yes. <laughs> always, always, of course. Um, and I was going to ask, how, how well has it sold? If you don't mind me asking, I don't, if I, we're not talking out of school business wise, but has, has it worked for has it worked for you, ITV Studios, and for and for Winfall? Well, my take is the fact that we're now in Series Three and quite happy. The answer would be yes. Carlo. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think what you do usually find on a series like this is usually one or two territories change or rotate as you go. So sometimes the launch of a series usually does well in about 80% of the places where you, you, you launch it and then you have to sort of sometimes chop and change partners depending on who comes in and falls out. So that's what, again why, you, you know, being in touch with different partners all around the globe, either yourself or through distributors can help repiece the deal together if someone's fallen out for sort of season two or season three. So I think uh, that's another element where global co-productions or distribution distributors can help depending on who the partners are. And actually that's true because that did happen with this one where there was a major territory that were not as quick off the mark on uh, one of the series and then we said look we'll, we'll pick up and pay the extra bit for that so we did do that and and with this series as well it sold um, not only to multiple territories but it sold again and again so secondary windows third windows even actually so yeah it's good. Oh, fantastic. Um, Carlo mentioned then finding co-producers, whether yourself or through an international distributor. So do you help with that? If you, you know, you'll put on advance for some territories, but, you know, maybe let us give you advice on the US or do, do you, will you, for producers that have much less experience in co-production, can you sort of advise them on that side as well? Yeah, so we can. Um, for us, it's obviously better if we can help uh, forge those sales on behalf of the producer. Um, I guess what you may be trying to get into here a little bit is, um, you know, I talked about 25% commission and then 5% cap. Uh, would we be in a situation ever where we would help pre-sell something maybe that would be a, a, a co-commissioner potentially and would we take a lower reduced uh, commission at that time? Yes, we can do that. Ultimately, going back to what is really what the vision of what we're trying to do is to try to get productions off the ground. We're trying to make you go out there and produce your shows. So how can we quickest uh, possibly get your um, footage onto TV, basically? So if that means that we need to try and help you find a co-commission um, in the US or say Australia or wherever it might be, uh, we might do that and just take 10% commission on that because we want most of that money then to go into production and then we might still help um, deficit finance um, on the top just again to get you to get you going. And also because and I, I think, think cash flow is quite an important part. And I think also the, the relationship with the distributor carries on through production. Like I think I remember on the first series of this that during the production process the, the, uh, the uh, ITV managed to get a, a, another partner to come on board and they were quite keen of, as a they'd come on board if they could have an episode that was made in their territory and, and as the dialogue as the dialogue progressed, we agreed and we managed to swap out a story and, and, and it worked really well for them. So I think that keeping the dialogue going with the co-partners and also the distributors you go can be quite advantageous in terms of uh, exciting people and, and, and getting the series launched, actually. Yeah, and I think, you know, you should think of the distributor as a helping hand, really, because we're not there to hinder you. We're there to help you um, and make it better, if possible, or make it more sellable, if possible, because I mean, this is a unique one because you have more than one uh, commissioning boss, if you like, so you have more than one territory to think about. But often, um, you know, if, if you have just one commissioner, the distributor can help guide you through all the other people's needs and wants and, and manage that for you. So you don't have to really worry about that and you can just go off and make your show. Yeah, it's the, it's the ultimate symbiotic relationship, isn't it, actually, uh, between producer and distributor, I think. Uh, and it's really easy to underestimate the level of expertise that your sales teams have in that space, both editorially and financially. I think that's it's worth people knowing that. Yeah, and I think, you know, so, so for us, because we have a team in America, we have a team on the ground in Australia, New Zealand. There is a team on the ground in India, in Hong Kong, in France, in Scandiland, uh, and of course here in, in the UK. That's, that's incredible. Think of all those people basically working for you on the ground in those territories, talking to all the commissioners and all the buyers. And um, you, you can't almost do that yourself being based in one, one territory with the exception of Carlo who has done that himself by traveling around the world so much. But he, he is unique.
he, he doesn't talk about it much, but he's quite unique in that respect, I'll say. Yeah, I think, I think, I think it's, it's worth Go on, Carly, sorry. Oh, I, th I think there are quite a few people who do that, but it's, um, um, yeah, I think uh, I think there's quite a lot of producers who are, trying, uh, are learning the sort of trade of doing the co-producing. And it's actually really encouraging to see other people navigating the relationships with different partners in that way, I think. And just talking about versioning and, and what, what you take, uh, Seth, from, from this. So, Carly, you talked about trying to avoid multiple versions. Very sensible. Quite often distributors do want a version, an international version, at a different length or what do you tend to do in that case Seth? i mean and similarly with conjoined twins have you taken different versions for different territories no not for conjoined or twins so so no, so for others. What, what one after yeah so, so i think what you have to think about is if you're often if, if you have a linear broadcaster they might like um what i call a bbc length which is close to an hour so maybe 58 minutes but often a commercial hour uh, which is anything you know um i think for us it's it's 42 minutes, maybe the absolute lower range of an hour, but the sort of 46, 40 is like a sweet spot, which I also think is the, incidentally, the ITV and often the Channel 4 hour. And that's okay. But uh, when we sometimes take different lengths, it is to service those people who are um, either a commercial or a linear channel, or we need to have the right to be able to cut it down. Or there might be snap-ins that you can provide um, if there's a linear broadcaster who needs to have those extra minutes added on to well, the tail end or the front end or wherever it might be. But now, interestingly, all the SVOD platforms, they don't care. No, it's one of the great things about SVODs, isn't it? They don't care about duration, totally. Uh, and really what about things like reverse? Obviously, a lot of a lot of DocFest um, makers would use a lot of archive. Sometimes that might have to be removed or re-cleared. Yep. Uh, I'm thinking uh, I might not be the best person to even talk about that. Anthony is really good gonna, about I, archive. Yep. I was I was trying to use that as a segue into Anthony. Um, so um, this is why I'm behind the camera. Um, so Anthony, should we move on to Attenborough? And uh, obviously you have a long and fruitful relationship with him. And do you want to talk about this latest one and queue up the clip? I fear you're okay. muted, Anthony. I don't know if this is a technical glitch. Oh, he's gone totally now. Uh, uh, there we go. Perfect. <clears throat> I was just sitting quietly listening to these fascinating productions that are being made. Um, anyway, um, the, this film came about because I'd been lucky enough to make 13 either series or specials with David over about eight, 10 years. And it wasn't just the in front of the camera stuff, but, but uh, I developed a good relationship with him so we could look at how he made things and he could talk about the past and so i knew we had a a, a very special film about literally his journey um <clears throat> and the question was where, where should that belong you know should that belong on bbc should that belong on sky uh <clears throat> but in the end i decided it belonged on sky for a, a very clear reason that they had, we had, David and I had gone for three years or four years to Sky and made a, a number of 3D films, which obviously were shown in 2D, which were, I think, pretty successful. And uh, the licenses on the, uh, the BBC shows we'd done, such as Great Barrier Reef, Rise of Animals, and so, so on and so on, we, we were able to move those rights across to Sky. Uh, and I knew that Sky was launching new channels, and I like the idea um, that those channels would be available because don't forget iPlayer hasn't always, you know, given us great lengths on programs. I like the idea that we're going to be, have a long shelf life on Sky. So I knew Sky was the main partner. Um, then there are quite a lot of partners around the world we could have gone to, but I went to ABC Australia because ABC had a long relationship with co-producing all the Attenboroughs. Uh, and then I thought, well, where do we go distributor wise? And I just had a very good experience with ITV Studios when we did a, a ITV show, it was sold around the world, obviously, by ITV Studios, uh, Judy's Borneo. So I liked the way they'd handled it. I liked the way they'd marketed it. And we worked with lots of distributors, and we always will work with lots of distributors. But I was very impressed. But more important, I, it wasn't just about the money. Obviously, we had a shortfall still. It was really about having a distributor who is going to take an important show like this 
and and actually distribute it in the right way to the right partners in the right, you know do, doing the the right kind of approach because that was a pretty special kind of person. So yes, it was the money, but um, it was it was equal to me. And it's not always the same with all productions. I can tell you, it it, it it was equally getting the right amount of money, but getting that approach right. And I felt they they did that really. Uh, and you know, it's a kind of important film, and I felt they would get it out to the world really. What a lovely clip. It's such an amazing range of clips as well. So it's a great catalogue. Um, no, it, so, it was kind of interesting. Yeah. Sorry. So, Cess, I mean, I would ask what attracted you to the project. That's not hard to answer, I don't think. But um, talk a bit about your thought process when Anthony came to you with this one. So in some characters in the world, David Attenborough is like royalty. He's gold dust. And they love anything that has anything to do with him. Whereas in other territories, he's insignificant because like in Germany, for example, he gets dubbed into German and his voice doesn't mean anything. And of course, uh, for many years, he is the voice of God, isn't he, in terms of um, natural history programming. But what was amazing about this, in any case, is that it is about David Attenborough, but it's also uh, looking at natural history a little bit through the ages. And I think what was really more interesting about that is right now there's a big trend about co-viewing and bringing the whole family together uh, to watch one screen as opposed to four or five people sitting in different rooms in the house looking on different screens. And that's what this type of programming um, provides. And so we were really excited about that. And not only could it do that, it's natural history. It is uh, so David Attenborough. And so they have you, ha you have access, gold dust. Uh, and of course, don't you feel like that clip, like it feels like someone's giving you a great old hug? That's what I felt like. So yeah, I mean, how could you say no? And Anthony, when you're when you're coming up with this editorially, do you do you think about finance and costs and how you're going to finance it and co broadcast co producers and distributors, or do you come up with the idea and then um, and then go out and try and find the money? I think I think it varies. Something like this, you know. I think that I thought it was financeable because because of, you know we had this unique vision. No one has has filmed David behind the scenes in this way, so that's something very special about that. Um, but yeah, but of course we had an eye on eye on budgets and things. We had to because uh, actually getting in <clears throat> archive and things is is expensive, you know. Um, but a lot of it, I'm glad to say, came from effectively our own archive, uh, which, which is nice. Um, but as I say, this film, I felt I wanted to place it in the right place because you know when I'm when I'm thinking about making a David Attenborough, I'm not thinking about two years. I'm thinking about ten years. I'm thinking about with the films we've made with him what's going to happen to them in 10 years time. And that's always been my philosophy. You know, the, I've been a guardian that's been lucky enough to work with him. And, you know, 13 productions is a lot. And it's, it's, it's sort of, we took him out of retirement and, you know, look at what he's done now. Uh, but we had a, we had a, a very special time. And I, I, again, I think worldwide, what I'm proud about in the period is we've grown because a lot of countries didn't know David Attenborough. And then they didn't need to know David Attenborough. He was just this guy in the museum at night in Museum Alive film we made, who who was was, was bringing creatures back to life. So suddenly, you expand that um, that whole horizon. And I think the big moment for us really was, and, and in some ways for David, was when we when I got Obama to sit down and interview him in the White House. I mean that you know nearly three quarters of a billion people watched that, and that kind of was the beginning of something that that uh, was was very special in terms of his back on the global stage. You know, he was seen as a global figure, uh, and a lot of people stood up in a lot of countries that never would have bought an Attenborough and realised that he was an international figure. And look at what's happened since then. You know, he's uh, you know he's guided us on a whole new journeys about climate change and all sorts of other things, and is a world ambassador now. Um, but in terms of programming. What I think is nice is that is the the sort of span we've had, and then with a show like this, you can get into whole new audiences. So as I say, it's, some shows are about getting the money and hopefully making some money beyond that. This one was was really getting it right. And to be honest with you, you didn't make a pound out of it. It wouldn't have bothered me. You know, this is a film that needs to get out there and show the real Attenborough. You know, which is you know he is an extraordinary, extraordinary man. Yeah, an amazing timing. Seth, so this is quite a useful way of getting into talent because there's sort of it's always been the golden rule trying to avoid talent for international. Mm -hmm. Is that still the case? I mean, obviously, you're not always going to have the opportunity of an interview with Obama to build your talent into territories where they're not known. 
Um, but if, if, if people watching this have ideas that have talent attached, should they remove them when they send them to you? Should, would you have a conversation no. about it? What? Yeah, because um, some talent may work better in territories than you think. And um, I think the other thing to think about when it comes to talent is, are you using the talent as a host? Or are you using mm -hmm. them as experts to tell the story along? So like, for example, quite a few of um, say, say windfall films, what they're making is they will use experts from different territories, but they're placed there. Well, one, because it might help for co-production, but two, because they actually are valid to bring in the story and take an editorial from A to B to C to D. And so, um, you know, if you have a, a, a scientific talent, for example, you might think, oh, you know, they're really boring. They're never going to sell them anywhere in the world because no one knows them except from the UK. But actually, maybe if they belong to the story, they should absolutely be there. So talents, yeah, don't take them out um, just because and um, try them because maybe they can be part of it. Maybe they, they can, they could be just the voiceover at the end, or maybe they just belong because that's how the story is best told. There's quite a good yeah, example. We've done. Seth, there's quite a good example here, which is interesting where, when we made the, the, the Judy Dench Borneo series and you distributed, we all thought, you know, gosh, America's going to be, it, it, you know, is going to be is going to be very tough. You know, and then it's been a very funny story. David Zaslov, who's now become king in you know the whole media business, but was then just just the Discovery Group, woke up one day and read read one of the news articles about what we were doing when ITV was showing in Britain about you know Judy with orangutans, and he apparently said, "I want that film." Everybody thought, well. Come on, Judy Dench on Discovery, that's really, and A, they don't have very many female presenters, B, you know, it didn't feel like a Discovery show. But they demanded to have this show, so we sold it to them. Um, and what was interesting is that, of course, we didn't know, but they were going to launch Discovery Plus. So out comes Discovery Plus, and it's the first offering on Discovery Plus. It did incredibly well. New York Times reviewed it. It got, you know, but, but this is what one's got to think about when you're thinking about distribution, you know. Where are those new opportunities? The world is changing. And I would never have thought in a million years that it would, the Discovery would have it, but little did I know there was this other channel with a much broader audience, a family audience that was coming along. So that, you know, it's worth watching these other platforms because they could well become partners when you really don't think they are. Yeah, it's fascinating. There as well, you have the, um, you have the idea of the, of the family viewing again, and Discovery Plus is all about bringing eyeballs to, why are we even promoting Discovery Plus? By the way, yeah, it's all about bringing eyeballs and, and bringing the <laughs> most eyeballs to one right. level. <laughs> well, I was going to come to that in a minute. Um, how quickly? Did, oh, yeah, go on then, Greg. How 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 quickly did you turn around your quickest project ever with Discovery Plus? I'm the interviewee, uh, not the interviewee. Um, <laughs> uh, the last one was in two weeks, but it's a fairly unusual project. Um, but just. That's very cheeky, says that was completely uh, discreet. Curable. Um, um, coming back to to talent, I think uh, yeah, I was going to say before Anthony uh, jumped in that the, those the idea of versioning talent is is I always used to think was nightmarish, but actually I've now done two or three but I shoot them walking around as presenter and shoot them sitting as talking head, and you can cut them quite easily together. And I think that kind of creative thinking for international versions is also really really important. Um, so we just got we're coming close to the end, um, but we've got a few questions left. Um, so that's the most practical one: is how do people approach you? And um, I want to get this in because the other questions will go on longer. How do people approach you? What's the best way? Is it you directly? Do you want the treatment? Do you want a funding plan? What's the what's what do you need, and how do you get it to you? So. Uh, I did talk about sending uh, an email. Please do do that. Um, I don't know if I should spell out my email now, but it's my first name dot my last name at itv.com. There you go. Um, yes, um, start with an email. Say you have an idea. Feel free to send the idea then. If you have a sizzle, if you have a character reel, if it's talent involved, um, if you maybe have a had a sniff from a broadcaster or you're not sure which broadcaster to approach, we can also help with that. Um, but yeah, email is good to start with, and then and then we'll take it from there. Uh, as part of our team on the non-scripted side, it's not just me. It's also I have two colleagues called Kelly and Harry, and so um, as a sort of three-part unit, we work very closely, all of us together, all the time. But it might be me that you hear from. It might be uh, either of the two of them. But everyone knows everyone's business if that if that's helpful, um, and so sort of, um, so we help them complement each other. So yeah, wait, was that the question? Yeah, that was the question. 
That was, that was indeed the question, yeah. Um, and another one for you, and then we've got an interesting one about um, formats. Um, do you have, are there any genres that are off limits? So this question specifically about sports and whether you consider sports, but are there any things where you're like, that just won't sell, don't bother, it will be wasting all our time, so are you completely open-minded? So sports is an interesting one. If you can see the entertainment part of it, if it's access to a specific sport legend or it could be a sports club or there's something that can be told about um, sports that you would see on a general entertainment channel type thing. So could you imagine seeing that on ITV, for example, um, uh, versus ESPN sports? then yes, then it's probably something you should look at. Uh, and even more so now because it's all about access to people and places. And uh, the one thing that we don't ever look at because we are not experts at it and we would not be your best partner in terms of distribution is uh, children's programming. And if you do have a children's programming show and you're wondering where to go, I can tell you really good distributors who, who, who work in that space. And it's because it's such a niche area and it's such a niche amount of buyers around the world that will buy children's programming, whether it's live or animation. And so, um, yeah, we, we don't work with that. But everything else. Yeah, it's nice to have a broad range. Um, and this is one probably for all, all three of the uh, producers around the virtual table. Um, can we talk about the wider exploitation of IP beyond selling a doc or finding a co-producer? So how do you, for example, make a format out of a single or how do you sell drama rights? Um, how do you expand? Um, do you do that in concert with the distributor or do you tend to do it individually and sort of within your own development teams? I don't know who wants to start, Carlo? Um, we um, sometimes we've actually licensed the format, right? We'd, we've done very few formats that aren't uh, that are sort of you can make it in each different country. But we've we've done that before. We've licensed the format rights to one distributor and, and the actual finished UK program to another um, because they were very different sort of niches in terms of uh, selling them. But it's probably best that the, both kind of rights can come to the same distributor. And then we were actually involved in the discussions with the with the different countries that wanted to do what, which who optioned the format. How to do it because it was very very complicated unique access uh medical uh format um so so we've we've done that not very often but um we've we've done that with our rights in the past and una how do you go about building building ip out of say a single i mean is it do you find it worth the effort or do you tend to just move on i mean as in turning it into a series or or as they say drama rights there and that in very specific cases it it very much depends on the content if we can i mean we're getting better at it we didn't used to look at it very much at all um but nowadays um especially with access or people driven documentaries that you make you sometimes think hmm there's some more in there let's have a conversation with the people we're dealing with and try and get them on a shopping agreement or an exclusivity agreement and then uh, go with what you've got and either work with the distributor if they've got the format rights and you um, work with them to see if you can expand it or you go back to the broadcaster or you just think, actually, I'm going to do this and then I'm going to go back to everybody and tell them afterwards I've done it. It depends on what rights you retain. Um, for a lot of series we do nowadays, um, I mean, not for two parters like Conjoint, but for something else we've just done, um, they will accept they will expect a format viable more nowadays, even if it's not a straightforward format, even if it's something where you consider this as a history series, it's not a format. But if you can clad it into a format, then the big distributors often like having it in order to see if they can make sales out of that as well as finish tape. So it's, it's more and more you have to think, you think more and more commercially about um, what you can do with the access if you've got, can you do more? And if you can, you really, really have to get them to sign up to you as quickly as possible. Because you, you, they are, the yeah, take... contributors are also a lot more aware nowadays of what they can yeah. do with their stories. I think, I think actually that the world is about to change, not that many of us probably are aware of it, but we're about to go from the mobile phone era to the immersive era, which means that we will get headsets and things with our phones and suddenly the world changes. And what I think factual producers need to realize, and we've got, we have a whole company that now does this, is growing incredibly fast and works with Apple and all sorts of other people, but is about how, what do you do with those elements inside a factual program that you can take on another journey? Because eyeballs are going to move away from television and move to these new interact. We've just put out an app, in fact, an Amber app, um, with where you can literally download it on an Apple phone and the whole desk comes alive and you interact with it. It's, it's something completely new. 
that world is going to expand in the next three or four years. So I think there's going to be great opportunities for distributors and for production companies to be aware of that. Now, we happen to have set a company up, which in the last seven years, it just does that. Uh, but I can tell you that the future holds strong for people who have great <laughs> content and great ideas, and they can move them to AR, <laughs> VR or platforms. Agreed. And I think yeah, <clears throat> we haven't even had a chance to come on to things like Curiosity Stream and different versions and all of that, sadly. Maybe that's a session for this time next year. Um, so with two minutes to go, um, thank you, everyone. Since success, I've been asked, what do you think your most successful project is since you've been doing this job and why? Oh, that's a really hard question. And you know what? There isn't... I'm just, I'm just getting my own back. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, well, we're quite good with, um, you know, uh, blue lights and police uh, series. Was that good? Was that a good plug? Uh, no, we, um, what, okay, what is, what's been the most successful project for us? We, we have had good success with all our crime offering. And, and I think that's where I have to talk about one offs and series. So something like the real deaths. Uh, was, was, a, was it's been a great hit for us, which was a one-off. Uh, we have we have more crime offering, Fred, Rose West, etc. Uh, Twenty-four hours in police custody is really good. Um, there's you know a format version of that that's being made, and that's kind of cool. And you didn't think that they could ever do that, but they have. Mm -hmm. And um, also for us, building giants has been big, and there's more coming from Windfall. That's also very successful um, recently. So in the engineering space, in the science space, in the access point space. Um, we had one also, uh, which I will mention, which, which, was, which was fun, you know, and it was um, uh, the inside life of, of the rich and wealthy in Monte Carlo. Um, so that was, a, that was a really fun one, but it's very different again. But again, it was about access. And of course, for us, natural history, very, very, very successful. We have a three party called the Magical Land of Oz, which has sold incredibly well. Uh, Attenborough's Journey has done really good um, numbers. On very quickly actually um, and I think it, it's true the sales team just absolutely went for it and and there's some more coming in that space um, from Atlantic as well and so um, yeah I think I think they are they, they are good ones and of course we have really high hopes right now for well I, I'm not even worried about conjoined twins that's gonna go and that's gonna be something that's gonna fly and fly I'm sure Fantastic. emotional Ending on a really... <laughs> um... Brilliant. Well, we've, we've, we've finished our slot. Um, thank you, everyone. I hope this has been useful for you all. Um, I fully expect Cess to have tens of thousands more emails than she already gets flying into her inbox <laughs> shortly. Excellent. Um, so, Bring it on. Brilliant. Right. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.